the praise team for leading us in worship. Uh, we all look forward to that day when we can do it live and join in. And also to Jenny for sharing with us. At this time, I would ask that you breathe a pair on Brent's behalf as he brings us the message based on Acts 5, 17 to 42, Joyful Disgrace. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Jenny, for that wonderful, that wonderful um, introduction and conversation um, about the fruit of the Spirit, um, about especially that, that focus on joy. Am, am I live here? This, this is good, good to go? Okay. And, and, and I, 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 I love that passage that, that Jenny shared, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Who really can describe this gift? You know, as, as we trust Jesus, Peter says we are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, a, a deep gladness found only in him. Do you know this in your experience? Jesus assures us, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. So often when we talk about discipleship, we emphasize the cost. And, and that's natural. Jesus does say, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. He, he calls for this, this radical, open-ended commitment. But, but what's his purpose? You think about the purpose of Jesus when he calls us to give up everything for him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer asked, if we answer the call to discipleship, where will it lead us? What decisions and partings will it demand? To answer this question, we shall have to go to him, for only he knows the answer. Only Jesus Christ knows the journey's end. But we do know that it will be a road of boundless mercy. Discipleship means joy. Discipleship, following Jesus, means joy. Does Jesus promise us a comfortable, hassle-free life? No. Will there be pain and conflict? Yeah, lots of it. And yet to know him, as, as, as Jenny said so well, to know him is to be filled with joy. And we see this vividly in Acts 5. The early Christians are in the temple courts, day after day, talking about Jesus, healing the sick, casting out impure spirits. People are, are touched and changed by the reign of God breaking into their lives. More and more are believing in Jesus. And what joy as they discover life in Christ. Verse 16 it says, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. The church grows, and so does its influence. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. So did, that's, that's in verse 17. Do they rejoice that God is at work? No. The temple leaders have a religious zeal, but they cannot imagine that the sovereign Lord would bypass their leadership. As they see it, they guard the holiest spot on earth, the temple in Jerusalem. Followers of Jesus are operating completely outside their permission and control. And so when they see signs that people are drawn to them, they're jealous. What about us? Do we get religiously jealous? God uses so many ministries and churches to draw people into his kingdom. Can we rejoice in that? I hope so. Well, 
what if we don't fully like the style or, or strategy or theology, but, but Jesus is exalted. Jesus is lifted up, and people are brought into his kingdom. I hope we can earnestly praise God. How, how do you handle feelings of jealousy toward a brother or sister? Even just ordinary run-of-the-mill jealousy, not necessarily religious jealousy. How do you handle that? Pray for them. Ask God. Ask God to protect them, to bless them, and prosper his work in them. Don't give Satan any room in your heart. Jealousy is like an invitation for, for, for Satan to find a lodging place in, in us. The temple leaders, they've, they've been given... Um, They've been, 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 been given this major responsibility. And with it comes political power. And so in their jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in jail. So this is a public statement. The Jesus movement will not be tolerated. Stay away from these troublemakers, they're saying. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. So God overrules the temple leadership. They have efficient police and secure jails, but as Tom Wright points out, there are no locked doors in the kingdom of God. <laughs> the angel instructs the apostles, go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. This new life. What a beautiful way to describe the salvation that Jesus offers us. Jesus is the author of new life. He's the author of life. Do you want to thrive? Fully alive? Give yourself to Jesus. The one who believes in me, he says, will live. Really live. This is a gift for today. This abundant, everlasting life. Because I live, you also will live, Jesus says. Everyone needs to hear it. The angel makes that clear. Make this your priority. Tell the people all about this new life. So at daybreak, at daybreak they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. They don't waste time. As soon as the temple reopens in the morning, they're back, full of the Holy Spirit, eager to share the treasure of life in Christ. So, picking it up partway through, through verse 21. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there, so they went back and reported we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Well, how unsettling that would be. They are specialists in religious management, but God refuses to be managed. What do you do when you're faced with uncertainty, with confusion, or, or with chaos? How do you respond? Do you trust the Holy Spirit to lead you through the dark, teaching you, stretching your faith? Or do you try to control everything? To try to get a handle on it? <laughs> Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. So the officials are careful. They don't want to provoke a reaction on the street. So the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. So this court had wide-ranging power in Jerusalem. 
to govern religious and, and political issues that, that Rome didn't care to handle. So there, there were 70 members in the Sanhedrin. There were priests and, and leaders of prominent families, teachers of the law. The high priest lead, leads the whole thing. And he challenges the apostles. He says, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. He said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Now notice, the high priest will not even say the name of Jesus. <laughs> he won't even say his name. Now who's really on trial here? It's like the, the, the high priest is playing, playing defense even, even as he's, um, even as he's, he's putting, putting the pressure on the apostles. Who's really on trial? The followers of the man they crucified or the authorities themselves? Can, can, can they face, can the authorities face the truth of what they've done? Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. They're not intimidated. We must obey God rather than human beings. My grandfather, Alfred Kipfer, once told me about a group of men from this area who had to appear before a military tribunal during the First World War. They needed to, to travel down, down to London to the, the, the army barracks there. Because of their faith in Jesus, they were, they were opposed to serving in the military. They agreed with the church's teaching that, that when Jesus said, love your enemies, he meant, at the very least, that you shouldn't try to kill them. But to receive conscientious objector status, they had to prove that they were committed, nonviolent Christians and not just trying to get out of a dangerous job. So each of them individually had to meet with a certain officer who had a huge disdain for young men who refused to fight. He ridiculed them, said they were cowards, yellow. With each one, he pointed out his window to a fresh mound of dirt. That's where we buried your buddy, he said. If you don't sign up to fight, you're going to end up with him. Well, he's he was bluffing, of course. But, but each of these young men were forced to ask, will I obey God, whatever the cost? It's an essential question. For Peter and the other apostles, the resurrection of Jesus settled it. If he's conquered death, what can we possibly lose by following him? The apostles don't defend their actions. As, as you might expect, but instead they take this opportunity, again, before the authorities, they take it as an opportunity to share the gospel. They say the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. So they, they, they speak as fellow Jews. They, they, they emphasize that shared precious heritage that they have with the religious leaders. The living God whom they, they all claim to worship, he has reversed their judgment against Jesus. The law of Moses in Deuteronomy 21, 23, says that anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. So by, by having Jesus crucified, by condemning him to that sinner's death, to suffocate under his weight, the weight of his body on that cross, the spiritual leaders of Israel had declared that he was under the curse of God, that Jesus Christ, God's only begotten son, was under his curse. Of course, it's true. In his love, Christ Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, became a curse for us. Who can fathom that sacrifice? That he bore the punishment we deserve. The righteous for the unrighteous. He's the righteous one. We're the unrighteous. 
in order to bring us to God. And as he did that, as he bore our sins, he became a curse for us. Well, his offering, his offering is powerful and effective. And how do we know? Because God raised his son from the dead. That is how we have confidence. And so as we kneel before him in faith, repenting of our sin, as we surrender to Jesus as our Savior and our Lord, we are then raised with him into new life. His shed blood breaks every curse over us. He cleanses us and rescues us from Satan's dominion so that we can experience the goodness and the glory of God. It was an effective sacrifice. So in in verse 31, the apostles add, God exalted him, that is Jesus, to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. So the, the very people who crucified Jesus, including the chief priests, like like all sinners, like us, are invited to receive this incredible salvation. So will they humble themselves before their crucified Messiah? Will they repent of their rebellion against him and take hold of that life that truly is life? The apostles conclude, we are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Peter, James, and John are human witnesses to Jesus Christ. But they're not alone. The Holy Spirit speaks through them. He joins them as a witness to Christ. So as they speak, you hear the message of God. Now do you believe that he would also do that through you as you rely on him. Now, obviously, the Lord imparted unique authority to those people whose words now appear in the Bible. You cannot replace the testimony of the apostles. These men who walked and talked face to face with Jesus, they were inspired to give us the New Testament the climax of the written word of God. So it's our canon, it's our measuring stick to evaluate every other claim, every other truth claim that's out there. So our testimony is anchored in theirs. And yet, without the Holy Spirit, our words fall flat. So when we speak about Jesus, may it also be true of us, just like them, that we are witnesses of these things together with the Holy Spirit. How, how does the Sanhedrin respond? Does, it, does this sound like good news to them? This message that the apostles bring? No. No, they they believe they already have everything necessary for repentance and forgiveness right there in the temple. The gospel embarrasses them. It violates their religious vision and their values. It offends their pride. Verse 33 says, when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them, the, the apostles, to death. It's what they did to Jesus. Now though, his followers received some surprising support. So starting in verse 34. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. So Gamaliel was a leading rabbi, well-known well known to us from from Jewish sources, even outside the Bible. Tom Wright says he was remembered as one of the greatest rabbis of all time, a man of exemplary devotion and piety who knew the law backwards, 
forwards, inside out, and upside down, and taught it to all who had sat at his feet. So when Gamaliel spoke, <laughs> everyone else listened. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thutis appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. So, so he reminds them of, about these two rebel movements. And, and in both of them, there was a popular leader who was killed. And then when that happened, their, their followers lost their enthusiasm and went their separate ways. So, so Gamaliel concludes, Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. It's remarkable. <laughs> Sanhedrin, who's part, or, or Gamaliel, who's part of the Sanhedrin, urges his colleagues to consider just that possibility that maybe the message of Jesus Christ and this work of his followers could actually be of God. Wow. Now, does this mean, the reasoning he uses, does this mean that every time that there's an enterprise that has success, that it carries God's blessing? Every movement that's out there that prospers? Well, no. There are, are still plenty of popular heresies, wonky philosophies, false religions in this world. But Gamaliel, he shows this great respect for the sovereignty of God. And he has enough humility to know that he and his Sanhedrin friends just might be wrong about Jesus. Now you never know who will suddenly speak up for our right to proclaim Jesus. One, one of the greatest defenders of religious freedom, especially for evangelical Christians in the past 30 years, has been Michael Horowitz, a Jewish-American lawyer. Now, he became a passionate advocate, advocate for persecuted Christians when it was hardly on anyone's radar. Just ministries like Open Doors and, and Voice of the Martyrs. God has often raised up Gamaliels to protect his people. An Ethiopian woman named Haragawain was healed of her blindness when someone prayed for her in the name of Jesus. Now, then just after the, gov the communist government fell in the early 90s, she gave an interview about her evangelistic ministry in Addis Ababa. She said, I go out in the morning and come back at night. I do not choose where I go. I preach to everybody. I don't care what tribe, whether they're priests or prostitutes, on the bus on the street, anybody I find. Once she received unexpected support from a communist soldier, she said, I was distributing tracts at Maskell Square one day when a man refused the tract I offered. He was about to strike me when a soldier pointed his gun at the man and said, take it. <laughs> a communist soldier. <laughs> I said, please don't do anything to him. <laughs> Finally, the man was so afraid that he took the tract. Well, we, we, we don't want to be protected by violence, right? But praise God for people like Gamaliel. Now I wonder, will we do the same for people of other religions? As followers of Jesus, will we stand up for Muslims, for Jews, for Buddhists, for Jehovah's Witnesses and atheists to defend their freedom, to practice their faith, or their lack of faith, even when we disagree with them. I hope so. Love your neighbor as yourself, Jesus says. Do to others as you would have them do unto you. Of all people, Christians should be the most zealous defenders of religious freedom for others. 
even as we long for them to receive abundant life in Jesus. The two things are not contradictory because no one can be coerced into the kingdom of God if there's not, if there's not freedom for them to make a voluntary response, if somehow they're, they're coerced into it, that does not honor God. Well, what, what impact does Gamaliel have on the Sanhedrin? Verse 40 says, his speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. So instead of death, they're whipped. Likely the 40 lashes minus one that's allowed by the law. Now that, that itself was brutal. They would have been struck with a three-stranded strap of calf hide on their back and their, and their front, their chest. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and they let them go. Now, do the authorities really expect them to stop given their track record? I doubt it. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. That is the, the name of Jesus. How can you explain such joy? In, in April, I, I spoke with Tefera Bakere, who came to faith in Christ when he was a university student in, in Ethiopia. Well, one day, his name was posted on a wall with nine other believers, the names of nine other believers. They had been expelled from the Communist Youth Association because of their faith. He said, that means even if you graduate, you don't get your diploma. You won't get work. Still, he says, we're very happy. Did they like pain? Or did they seek it out? No. But they remembered Philippians 1, 29, where Paul says, it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Tefer says that other Christian students whose names did not appear on that list were weeping because they had not been selected. Persecution was a normal part of life during that season. Nobody was complaining but was rejoicing in all that was happening in our lives because it was an opportunity to identify with Jesus. And they experienced the, the closeness, the intimacy with him, their relationship with him, even as they suffered. Well, we live in a different time and place, don't we? Canada largely respects religious freedom. Now, occasionally, secularism will go too far, like forbidding public workers in Quebec from wearing religious symbols. Or a couple years ago, when the federal government required employers to sign a, a statement that they agree with abortion rights in order to qualify for the, for the Canada Summer Jobs Grant. That was it's changed, of course, after public opposition. Overall, though, we have great freedom to practice our Christian faith. But what, what's more important, are we ready to obey God, whatever the level of freedom we have, the more important question is, are we ready to obey God, even if it's inconvenient, embarrassing, <laughs> or uncomfortable? Do we share the joy of the apostles who, who could rejoice when they suffered in the name of Jesus? There, there's not even a hint of self-pity in their response, is there? It says, day after day, in the temple courts, and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Oh, may we serve him with that same devotion. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Praise God.